everyone, and welcome to How to College, our podcast where we get together with fellow first gens to have real discussions on what it's like to be among the first in your family to embark on this journey of college. My name is Norma Torres Mendoza, and I'm really excited about today's episode because we will have one guest, Sofia, who will talk to us about her relationship with money and how her whole mindset has completely shifted and how she has begun to build her own wealth in her 20s. Let's get started. Hi, Sophia. Welcome to How to College for First Gen. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Of course. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? So my name is Sofia Sarate. I'm a Mexican-American raised in Laredo, Texas, which happens to be a border town. But I also spent several years of my childhood living with my mom in Guadalajara, Jalisco. I moved back to Texas when I was nine years old and basically had to relearn English. And so I was actually a really shy girl for a while because I would often feel embarrassed to speak up in school. I started college at Texas State University until I moved to New York City through a student exchange program that was actually meant to be four months long. But then I decided I just wanted to stay and graduated from Queens College with a bachelor's in accounting. Awesome. So I did not know that you transferred um, school. So tell us a little bit about how you decided to make that decision on not coming back to Texas and what is it that you loved about New York City? Yeah, so it was definitely a huge change, right? So I grew up in a very small town, 96% Hispanic. And so I basically grew up in a little bubble. And when I moved to New York, it was scary. But just in those four months, I realized you know, how much I had been missing out on in terms of cultural experiences and just living in a big city in general. And so I just thought I would have a lot more opportunities if I finished college in New York City because I wanted to start my career in New York City. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and there's so much to do there. So why did you decide accounting? So a lot of people ask me this because I always tell people how in high school I wanted to be a dancer like I wanted to major in dance. So it was like a complete 360 from that. But I also just like grew up with a very struggling financial situation when I lived with my mom. And so when I started college, I always said, you know, I want to major in something where I can have a career where I will never be in that situation where I'm struggling financially. And so you never hear of a struggling accountant, right? <laughs> and I can't say it's the sexiest career, but that was definitely my main driver for that. So it sounds like it was a lot of economic stability, but there are some of our first gens that listen to us that are high school students. So can you explain just very basic, what does an accountant do? Yeah, so I actually majored in accounting and you can go into a lot of different things with an accounting major. So you can become an auditor, right? Which is basically someone who is making sure that a company is being fair and truthful in the financial statements that they're that they're issuing. And so you can go into that or you can be a tax auditor. And it's all things ta tax, which I really, I would have never became a tax accountant because I was never good in tax, even in my college classes. But so I work at a public accounting firm, but I'm more on the financial side. So I work in the mergers and acquisitions financial consulting. And so what we do is consult our clients on whether a company that they want to buy or sell is worth the investment. Okay, so essentially, like a summary of it is what an accountant does is they make sure that companies are telling the truth about their financial situation. And then on your side, you work with companies that are looking to make investments. And so you help them figure out if it makes sense or not. In very simple terms, like if somebody may be thinking about buying a house, they might go to a financial advisor and say, does my investment make sense? 
Right, exactly. And so you alluded to this earlier on, you talked a little bit about your financial situation growing up and why that led you to having a career where you would have stability. So can you tell us like what it was like getting your first job, you got an offer, it had a lot of zeros next to your name. So tell us a little bit about that feeling and sort of what's going through your mind as you're getting these offers once you're graduating from college. Yeah, of course. So You know, I often have this discussion with my siblings about how we grew up learning such opposing views about money management, especially because our parents were separated and didn't agree on much. So growing up, my mom always had this like treat yourself mentality, but she's been in debt for as long as I can remember. And then my dad, he's your typical epitome of the American dream, came to the U.S. with nothing, didn't speak English and like worked his way up to the top. And to him, you know, he always remembers how hard he's had to work for money. So he's always been extremely frugal. So I grew up with that, like, you know, treat yourself mentality, but at the same time, don't spend on stuff that you shouldn't. But I think at the same time, I, it made me want things more because I didn't get them when I was growing up. And so when I first started making my own money, I was very irresponsible and was just, you know, spending it because I had it. So to me, it was like, if I had $200 in my account left, I'm like, okay, what else can I buy? And so I was also getting into credit card debt, even though I already had student loan debt, because to me, that was normal. It was just like, everyone has some sort of debt. So it's okay. So getting my first paycheck, you know, you start, you feel like an adult, but I was definitely not responsible about it until a little over a year now. So I can only imagine you growing up, right? Because this dichotomy is contrasted on a daily basis, right? Like the choices you make, mm-hmm. how you live your life. So even though you are making quite a bit of money, you are living in New York City, which is super expensive. Yeah. And so... <laughs> And and then like, did you feel also like pressure from your peers who were like always going out to brunches or always going to happy hours that you had to keep up with the Jones, if you will? And then at what point did you pivot and say, wait a minute, what, what am I working for if I'm just spending my money all the time? Yeah, a hundred percent. I So the difference between me and a lot of my peers or even coworkers, right, is that I have a lot of student loan debt that I chose to take on because I wanted to finish school in New York City and live in a certain neighborhood while I was in New York City. And so even though right now they're on pause, right? Like the moment I started paying them, I realized like, okay, most of one of my paychecks goes to rent. And then a big chunk of my other paycheck goes to my student loans. And, you know, my peers who might be making as much as me have all that money that I have to put into my student loans to just have fun. And so, yeah, I was definitely trying to keep up with the Jonases. And I even went on this like, whole trip abroad with some co-workers and I was like in a lot of credit card debt at that point but it was I just didn't want to miss out on any of these experiences only because I couldn't afford it technically because you know I'm getting into debt by doing these things so was there a moment that it kind of like the light went on and you were like wait a minute I don't want to miss on these experiences right because they are important and, and I totally get it they're important for our career progression and building relationships Mm -hmm. with their colleagues. But at the same time, how do you reconcile those two things that you're like, I actually want to move to maybe building some type of wealth and not being, you know, paying credit card to credit card to credit card. Yeah, I think what hit me the most was the beginning of the pandemic, because, you know, this just like put a pause on everyone's lives, right? And so I went back home for like two to three months and was staying with my dad. He was basically, you know, feeding us and everything. All I had to do was just pay my rent because I had my apartment in New York City. But I started realizing how I had no, I wasn't going to have any trouble, you know, like I wasn't worried about losing my job, but I realized that without that job security, my financial situation would be very bad. And I would probably have to move back home and figure out, you know, what to do. But so I was able to save some money to pay off that credit card debt that I had. And then since I had so much free time, I started reading books about, you know, 
getting out of debt faster, saving money, investing, watching. I started watching YouTube videos and, you know, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I like YouTube, but I like, I'm not afraid to look up, you know, investing for dummies. <laughs> and so I think I started realizing that even though I had a major in accounting and worked for an accounting firm, school doesn't teach you anything about personal finance. And so you have to do that on your own. So, you know, I learned accounting, but I learned how to account for companies, not for myself. And so the idea of, you know, me missing out on being able to build wealth just because I don't understand how to do so really bothered me. And it, I still hate the fact that so many people out there are missing out on, you know, this opportunity only because they don't know that they can. I totally follow you on, on that point because I, when I was like 22, like I still remember my first check and I was like, wow, this is an incredible amount of money. And yet I had no idea about starting a 401k, right? Like no idea mm -hmm. about this concept of paying myself first before my taxes were even taken out. So it sounds like you learned quite a bit of that through YouTube. What other resources did you use to sort of change that mentality of actually, I don't want to be in debt. And not only do I not want to be in debt, but I want to be accumulating for the future, whether that's in your retirement fund or whether that's investing straight in the market. What other resources did you use out there? One of my biggest drivers is the fact that I don't want to be an employee forever. Something that a lot of people dream of or, you know, being business owner someday. But, you know, we're in this hamster wheel where if all you have is your salary, then you're just surviving basically, right? Because you're making X amount of money and you're paying off your bills and then the rest you're using to go out or as fun money. And so I realized that if I just stuck to my job or my salary, then I was never going to have money to save enough to eventually be on my own and try to start my own business or something. And so I, I got real interested in the stock market, but I didn't really know how it worked. I just knew the basics, right? Like you can buy stocks, you can sell stocks, you can make money off the stock market. But I know how risky it is and how much money you can lose. So that's why I was watching so many YouTube videos. And I think for a long time, I just had this idea that you needed like thousands of money to start investing. But you really could just start investing with 10 bucks. I mean, it wasn't 10 bucks, but I started with $100. I learned better in practice. So I bought some stocks and Obviously, during the pandemic, if you invested into anything at this point, like you've made a profit. Absolutely. All yeah. stocks are basically on sale, right? <laughs> like, so there are a lot of people who started investing during the pandemic that think now they're investing pros. <laughs> But just seeing like from practice, okay, if I'm buying this just because I like the name and then I'm losing money, then I'm not doing my research, right? Or I actually wanted to invest in something long term. So there is something called index funds, which is an investment vehicle in which you you can invest in. And it's like you're investing into a bunch of different companies instead of just one. But these index funds don't grow from, you know, one day to the next. So they don't generate huge returns right away. So a lot of people are like, no, 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 like I want money fast. But if you're into long-term investing, then this is a great vehicle because you just have to have that mentality of like, set it and forget it. But I do understand, want that like excitement of, oh, how much money can I make? So I always tell people, you know, you should invest into index funds just because it's safer. And then if you have some money set aside, you can use that as like, quote unquote, play money, right? To see just like how trading works. But yeah, so I'm, I'm a fan of the stock market. I know real estate is another way in which a lot of people like to invest their money. I just don't think I would have enough time to put up with the property management that comes with it. But there are a lot of people who will swear by it. I think you are highlighting very important things. And I know that a lot of these terms might be new to our audience, like index funds. As you mentioned, there are many companies. You still are an owner of those companies. It's just a lot of them put together and it obviously decreases the risk because you can essentially like invest in 
all of the U.S. economy. So I think that that's very useful advice. What other ways are you utilizing to build wealth? So you obviously put your money in the stock market. You mentioned that you don't do real estate. What about your 401k, your Roth IRA, if you have one? What are other ways that you are ensuring that you're saving for the future? I definitely have a 401k that I've been putting money into since I started working full time and my company matches it at 5%. So that's, you know, that's one of those investments that I know it's there for me, but I never really check it, but it will definitely, you know, accumulate to a good amount of money in the future. And then another thing that I actually will usually tell people is that before actually investing, you should have an emergency fund. So I created an emergency fund during the pandemic because I read about it too. And this amount of money will vary, right, from person to person because everyone's financial situation is completely different. And so people will save three to six months of living expenses as a as an emergency fund. I don't have that much, but I have enough money to where if an emergency were to happen, I would be able to pay for it. And so you don't want to to invest your money, let's say into the stock market, and then you have an emergency happen, like you have to go to the hospital or something. And then you have this huge bill to pay. So you don't want to be forced to take your money out of the stock market because you need cash and take it out at a loss. Right. And not to mention the capital gain taxes that you might have to pay exactly. if you have been there less than a year. No, that, that makes total sense. So and the conversation that you and I are having today is obviously comes from a, a place of a lot of privilege, right? Because we are now talking about having a job that allows you to not just pay the bills, but it allows you to now begin thinking about the future, not just for yourself, but maybe for your future generations. And I know that at least for me, it's very hard to think about doing this, especially when like a lot of my family members are struggling. And I think that it has so much to do with the first gen experience and maybe even survival guilt, right? That like we quote unquote made it and we quote unquote have money and we see our family members that are might not be doing so well. So I would love to hear from you how you think through that and how do you rationalize putting this money on the side, knowing that maybe you could be helping someone like today. There are negative effects to building wealth because I know this is true for many cultures, but Mexican culture places such a high importance on family and helping one another in times of trouble. So my whole life, I have seen the way my mom's side of the family constantly comes together to help with whatever they can financially. And many times this help was given to us when my siblings and I lived with my mom. So naturally, I always want to give back to those who have been, you know, a huge support for me throughout my life. And every now and then I will send money to my family if I'm able to. However, you you always have to remember that you can't pour water out of an empty glass. And as much as I love to help out all of my family financially, I can't always do that if I don't help myself first. So I have to make sure that I have my own financial plan set up for the future. Yeah, and I think what you're saying is really important because you are coming from a place of values, not a place of greed, right? You're saying there are some things that matter to you specifically, Sofia, that you want to accomplish. And you obviously have to take care of yourself to be able to help others, which definitely resonates. And you alluded to this earlier on, but I, I do want to emphasize that I think building wealth should begin with the why, like, why are we doing this and for what? And you mentioned that you wanted to, at some point, be your own boss and start your own business. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, what is it that, what's your goal and what's driving you to, to build this wealth now? Yeah, so something that I've said ever since starting college was that I would choose a career that would allow me to be financially independent so that I wouldn't have to rely on other people. And if I ever chose to, you know, like marry someone, I would do it out of love and not to have someone take care of me, as well as having kids. I know what it feels like to be a kid and see your parents stressing over money. So I would never want to put kids of my own through that. But besides that point, it's very hard to build wealth with a salary alone. And so my salary alone allows me to survive in New York City and to maybe, you know, have my social life. But if I don't invest some of that salary, then I'll never have that financial cushion that would give me peace of mind. And so, yes, you know, I have um, 
ideas of what my future might look like. And, you know, I would love to eventually be a business owner. But what I'm ultimately looking for to get out of building wealth is the peace of mind. This is very intriguing to me because I think a question that oftentimes I think about is, at what point are we building that peace of mind? So is it a number for you? Is it a stage? Like, how do you know you've actually realized your goal? And how do you quantify it? Or I would just love to know, like, when you think it's enough? Yeah, I think that's actually such a good question for everyone, right? I recently read a book called Your Money or Your Life, and they really touch on this hard. And so everyone has a different point, right, to where you have enough. And so this enough is not just, you know, you're surviving. So you have enough to where you're being able to pay your bills, you get to have a social life. and But, you know, for me, it's like, I would like to maintain my lifestyle and my social life, maybe at the point that it is right now. But I would also like to be able to help out family and friends if, you know, they needed help. And so, you know, I I don't think that you can quantify it, but I do think that everyone can get to a point where you just have too much money. And so that's when a lot of people start giving it away, right, to charity or things like that, and other people don't. And so, you know, it just comes down to what causes you care about. But I I definitely don't think that you can quantify it. But I think it's more like a feeling that you know that you have enough money to, you know, have that peace of mind because you're not losing any sleep over it. But yeah, I don't know exactly, you know, what that amount would be for me. No, I think it's a, it's a hard question that I think a lot all the time. How many more years am I going to do my job? At what point do I feel that it is enough? Because as you mentioned, every time you get promoted, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I actually could afford to do more with my life. And so I think for me and my husband, at least, is is really important for us to think through our lifestyle. And are we modifying it every time I get a promotion? And if so, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or do I need to like scale back? Just to give you a perfect example, right? We just came back from Chicago and it would have been so easy for us to like Uber everywhere. But then I did the math and I was like, wait a minute, a, a train is easy here in Chicago. Chicago, I can use it. and It's $5. You know, like I have to wrestle back and forth in my brain. I'm okay, I could live a different life, but I choose not to because of a greater purpose. Because if not, I, I'm just going to continue in this rat race that you describe, right, where I'm making more, but I'm also spending more and then I'm not really accumulating anything at all. Right. And yeah, that's exactly it. I feel like so many people get stuck on that rat race, because every time you get promoted, you're expenses go up with your salary because you know you're like I'm working hard for this I deserve to treat myself or go out and yeah I mean you just have to get to a point where you're like no I'm I'm okay with how I'm living right now and now I'm in a position where I can actually put money aside and I think you hit it right on the nail I think we justify it by saying I work so hard I deserve this (laughs) and then like if I started every sentence like that I wouldn't be putting any money away. You know, I would be like, well, I deserve this and I deserve that because I put in 12 hours a day. So I think just checking yourself on those little things is important. Yeah, but I think it's actually, you have to look at it from both sides, right? Because I think that I tend to be an extremist. And so I've been in situations where I'm like, well, I'm working hard. Like, I know I'm I'm in debt, but I deserve to enjoy the fruits of my labor, right? But then I've also been in positions where I get so into budgeting my money and saving. And I'm like, no, 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 like can't spend on that because my budget. And my sister actually called me out on it once. And she was like, you know, you can have some fun because I was just being so extreme about, oh, I need to like save this amount of money. And so I do think that it can go both ways, right? Like you can get to a point where you're not even allowing yourself to enjoy the money that you're working hard for just because you're so intense about saving or building this wealth especially for young people if you start at a young age you have so much time to build the wealth it's just about getting started and being consistent with it yeah i think that's a really great point that you bring up because you you don't want to do either right you don't want to go 
and spend all your money all the time, but you also do not want to deprive yourself from the little things that are going to make a difference in your life. It's it's sort of how I put it, right? If it's going to make a difference that I'm not doing two layovers and two connecting flights because I'm just, I'm over it. I'm tired. I want to go home. I want to rest. Then I'm like, yes, we're going to spend the money. We're going to go home, you know, sooner than later. So yes, totally. I I hear you on that. And, and I have to check myself on, on both sides. I think I'm a little bit more on the like, super discipline, but my husband does a good job calling me out and being like, hey, chill out. It's okay. We can afford more than you think we can afford. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Sometimes the Uber ride is worth it. (laughs) Yes, agreed. Agreed 100%. The last question I have here for you is, do you have any tips for any of our audience that are all first gens that are interested in beginning to build their wealth? So you've already mentioned that one, I think a misunderstanding is you don't need to have thousands and thousands of dollars to begin doing it. We've already kind of discussed that balance between building your wealth, but also living your life, if, especially if you don't know, if, you know, how long we're going to be on this earth. So definitely that. But anything else that you think you wish you would have known when you started your career and for those people starting to create their wealth? I honestly wish that I would have had someone teach me personal finance growing up. I think this is stuff that schools should be teaching. But yeah, had I not done my own research, I'd be missing out on wealth building simply because I didn't understand it. And so I think people should do their own research and do what's best for them because that's, and that's what's most important. So for example, a lot of people will suggest that you pay off all your debt before you start investing, but that depends on how much debt someone has, right? So I paid off my credit card debt and I created an emergency fund before I started investing, but I still have student loans that are going to take me years to pay. But if I had waited to pay off my student loans to start investing, I would I would start investing years from now. And so, you know, that's money that could have been accumulating. I also wouldn't have taken advantage of like the stock market during the pandemic and stuff like that. So every individual financial situation is just so different. But once you are ready to start investing, I think the very first thing that people should do is have that emergency fund set up, but definitely get started ASAP. The younger you are, the more time your money will have for growth. And I think one thing that I learned really early on is not all debt is created equal. Not all of it has the same interest rates. Obviously, consumer debt comes with the highest interest. So you definitely, I would recommend that you pay that off, especially because I've seen some credit cards that do like 20% interest rate, which is like ludicrous. But that's another. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, then we, we could do a whole section on terrible like (laughs) credit cards out there but obviously my home mortgage for example right we took out quite a bit of it in our mortgage but it's at a 2.5 percent so am i better off investing yes absolutely right so like to your point it, it doesn't make sense for me to wait 30 years to pay off my mortgage before I start building the well. So yes, every situation is different and not all debt is created the same. And I love your takeaway here, which is do your research. At the end of the day, it's your life. You get to decide what choices you're making, but you're going to make better choices if you are informed. And so I think that is your takeaway there, making sure you're using the internet, you're using books, you're reading and become knowledgeable so that one day your dreams do become a reality and that, you know, you're not just building wealth for the sake of it, but that you have some like values and some goals in line with the money. In my opinion, the money is just a vehicle for you to do things that you're really excited about. Exactly. I agree. You know, so many people get to that point where they're, they have enough money. And so they're at the point where they can leave their job that they hate. They can start working on their dream job or, you know, traveling or doing things that they've always wanted to do. So to be able to do that stuff, I mean, I think it's like worth waiting for. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I thank you so, so much for being on our episode. But thank you so much for having me. Well, that's it, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in today to hear about Sophia. We learned some really important lessons. First, she talked to us about how her relationship with money began when she was just a little girl and how it influenced her decision to be an accountant given her own family financial struggles. Second, we discuss how her mindset about money has completely shifted and how she has reached a happy balance of spending money, 
living a life, but also thinking and building wealth for the future. Lastly, she gave us some tips on how to manage our 401k, on how to learn about the stock market, and on how to ensure that our choices are aligned with our values. Because at the end of the day, that is the big takeaway. Building wealth should be grounded on things and values that we care about. Until next time. <laughs>